Good day. How are you today? I'm Brian Nash from How We Got Here Genealogy History Lenses. I welcome viewers to my from my History Lenses channel as well. If you haven't been to one of my live streams before, the way I work it, I usually have a topic I discuss, and that near the end, at the end, I have a a chance for questions and answers and I'd love you to stick around to then if you're watching this on the replay um, I hope you get something out of this and I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, a period of history that um, happened in Scotland and so this is not genealogical necessarily completely in nature um, though people of Scottish ancestry, it's important to know these things and give you an understanding of the culture and the events that happened in your ancestors' lives. Um, so I'm talking about a, a period of history called the Killing Times. Now, as you can imagine by the name, it wasn't a pleasant period in Scottish history. Um, it derives its name from, well, basically um, S Scottish Covenant or, or Scottish Presbyterians were basically being um, hunted down, being, being killed. Um, I'm going to focus today actually on a, a particular story that is one I heard many years ago. Um, it's about... Uh, this was about not just these two women it was actually there was multiple people that happened at this time but the story is going to focus specifically on these two women named murder one being older and one being younger and how they were brutally put to death and the reason is they refuse to say that the king was more important than Christ, basically. That they would be ruled above, uh, by the king, above Christ. Um, and this is really a poignant thing. Uh, um, I'm a Presbyterian on my mom's side by, um, by tradition and from the family. Um, Though I was raised in a Catholic church, so and but I later became a, a Reformed Presbyterian. Some people might call me a Calvinist. Um, it's a term to be that's been used, but I refer the term I'm an Evangelical Reformed Presbyterian. Um, by Reformed, it means that I hold to the um, principles of the the Protestant Reformation. And you'd think, well, all Presbyterians are Protestants, so don't they? And no, many of the precepts and the the things that were important in the Reformation have been put aside for um, in many Presbyterian churches that you find in Canada, the United States, and, um, Australia, New Zealand, and in Scotland itself. Um, the particular church I go to is called the Free Church of Scotland um, here on Prince Edward Island. It's a great church, a great minister that we have currently, um, who is faithful to the um, the teachings of the Bible as understand from the perspective of the Reformation. So these killing times were the Scottish, they were called covenant and the reason they were called Covenanters is because they, one of the, um, the, the uh, historical documents that Reformed Presbyterians hold to is something called the Westminster Confession of Faith. This was a basically a confession of faith that laid out what you believed as a, as a, 
Scottish Presbyterian, as a Reformed Presbyterian. Well, at that time, there was no other type of Presbyterian. Um, and it differentiated between the Episcopalian Church that was of England, the Church of England, and the idea of Presbyterianism. Um, one of the big differences is the ecclesiastical nature of the Anglican Church as opposed to the um, the Presbyterian churches. One of the things is really interesting. The queen, uh, and I point out, is she died as a Presbyterian since she was in Scotland. Um, in Presbyterian churches, the, the king or queen are members of the church. Whereas in the Church of England, the king or the queen are the head of the church. Um, whereas in Scottish Presbyterian, it's, they are an equal member because Christ in the sphere of religion is king. Um, so these covenanters, out of the, the Westminster Confession of Faith, there was also something that came about called the Solemn League and Covenant. And basically these were the people who signed that they believed these things. Um, and when William Cromwell was trying to start the English Revolution and they were trying to get rid of the um, king and queen, he relied on a lot of support of the Covenanters, which was eventually, um, eventually was basically turned away afterwards. In fact, um, the Covenanters later sided with um, King Charles II, and he actually turned their back when he got to England. Um, he used them and turned his back. Um, anyways, the, these girls and many others like them were were murdered because they held to the beliefs. Um, so I'm gonna actually, I found uh, really great recently a, a Scottish what, uh, YouTuber that I, I hadn't really watched much of and I, I, um, I've talked about Scottish history tours in the past, and he actually recently did a video on this as well. But this is a video by a, a Scottish YouTuber called Scotland Unplugged. And I really recommend if you want to uh, see some, learn some history of Scotland and, and see the places. He does some really great, I, I want to call them vlog style, because he visits a lot of locations. Um, he'll go walking the, the fields where battles were held, et cetera. Um, anyways, he talks about these these particular martyrs. Um, and anything I could say, I've, I found that I wanted to say, he says so much better. Because he's there and he has the, um, the means of doing it. So I'm going to share that and I'm going to stop it. I'm going to talk a, a little bit about some things. Uh, and again, remember, stick around uh, till the end so you can uh, ask your questions. And again, from a, a genealogical perspective, it's important to understand these are the things that shaped your ancestors. These were some of the things that had happened in their family's recent past um, before they, they came to the new world, before they um, came to uh, Canada. United States, Australia, and if you're in Scotland, these are the things that your forefathers who lived on the land you live now had to to endure, all for the cause of their faith and what they believed. And I find it really, as a Christian these days, you, a lot of times you're challenged and you, you're left to wonder, would you have show the faith that, that these, these these people during this time, this, this particularly the, the second guard, um, Margaret, Margaret Wilson, who's the younger one, the, the faith that she showed. So I'm going to start that video now from, from uh, Scotland Unplugged. And we'll talk about it. So I just want to make sure that the audio is set there. Just one second here.
give me one second here. I want to make sure I actually have to see you that with the, the audio. And okay, perfect. I have it set to share the audio. So let's, let's go. Why does this town have so many bookshops? Why does the name have nothing whatsoever to do with hair pieces? And why were two women drowned at the stake here in 1685? That got dark quite quickly. Welcome to Scotland Unplugged. I'm Robert Parker, and this is the story of the Wigtown Martyrs. And it's kind of personal. Cross the border from England into Scotland, hang a sharp right, and you'll find Galloway. It's kind of like Scotland in miniature. It has a little bit of everything. Hills, sea, rivers, history, mythology. And just like everywhere else, just a little bit of darkness hiding under the surface. And this is Wigtown. Nothing to do with actual wigs. The theory goes that the name has to do with the bay it sits on. Wigby, or Vicby, which is a sort of anglicised corruption of the Old Norse for water inlet. Baby. So big of you, they named it twice. Galloway translates very roughly as amongst the stranger gale. The stranger gales in question were a bit mixed up. They were probably a mix of Gaelic and Scandinavian. This place wasn't even part of Scotland until 1234, and it kind of still feels like somewhere else. It's not quite Scotland, not quite Ireland. Maybe I can't actually say that. Maybe I'm not qualified. I'm slightly biased because I'm from here. I grew up in and around Wigtown, and my mum's from there. My mum's whole family are from there. In fact, my mum still lives there and owns a coffee shop in the town which I like to visit frequently. Wigtown is Scotland's national book town and has been officially that since about 1998. There are roughly 20... So what he's doing here is he's just actually giving you a really good introduction to the community itself. Um, so he hasn't quite got to the, the history part that we're going to be talking about, but it, it is really interesting. And I, I, like I said, I just want to share the whole video and, and talk about it because um it is um it, it, it he, he tells the story well um and it is interesting when you do search wake town um one of the if you search just wake town one of the first things that comes up um is uh, the talk about their bookstores and he's going to go into a little bit of that i really like that because i'm kind of a bibliophile myself i love old books so let's Go from here. The bookshops in the town and around the town. The biggest one, the biggest second-hand bookshop in Scotland, in fact, is the one that's called The Bookshop. It's owned by a guy called Sean Bethel, who's had quite a few bestsellers with his diaries. But the reason this one's particularly interesting to me is because it used to be my great granddad's draper shop. Apparently, he had a spaniel that would sit in the window and would climb out at the end of the day, telling everyone it was home time. These are the county buildings, built in 1862 in French Gothic style and sitting at the heart of things. It used to be the sort of centre of administration and the home of the county court. My granddad was actually the court officer there, and part of his job meant that he had to live on the premises. I thought that was his house. But I did always wonder about the cell at the bottom of the stairs. Usually when I was going up those stairs on the way to my bed. A few weeks ago, I did a video about Greyfriars Cemetery. And as part of that, I spoke about the killing times and the Scottish Covenant. The Stuart Kings ruled over Scotland and England. Religion was always going to be a bugbear. James VI of Scotland eventually inherited the throne of England from his cousin, Elizabeth I. 
He was expected to be Catholic, like his mother, Mary Queen of Scots, and to restore the old religion to England. When that didn't happen, Guy Fox tried to blow up the Houses of Parliament. Scotland and England had separate churches, still do, but James wanted them as one church. One church, one country, one ruler. Maybe you heard something like that before. His son and grandson, Charles I and then Charles II, saw themselves as Episcopalians. They believed in divine right. Specifically, the divine right of the Stuart kings to be in charge. They believed they were put there by God and therefore head of the church. The Covenanters didn't really agree. And after signing their covenant in Greyfriars Church, they refused to submit to the crown. They'd meet up and worship in hidden places, but they were persecuted for it. It came at a cost. About 18,000 of them were killed between 1679 and 1688. A period of history known in... So that's a large number. 18,000, that's... Uh, that's population of a good sized town. In fact, the city closest to me on Prince Rhode Island doesn't have that many more people living there than that. Um, so it's a, yeah, it's a big, uh, it's a large number of people when you think of it that way. in Scotland as the killing times. And here in Wigtown in 1685 was one of the worst atrocities of the whole sorry tale. Hello everyone. And today I'm going to be showing you how to use words to make your videos really, really pop and stand out. Remove this for a second. And... And then I'm going to just add this back in because we don't need to watch their ad. Um, so let's add this back and we'll continue. Take a wander down to the shore along the old railway line and you'll find a walkway leading out into the salt marsh and the sea beyond. So this is one of the things that I, I said would make some his videos that I've watched so good um, is his able ability to go to the sites and and take you there and he 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 makes you feel like you're there with him so which helps history come alive. Don't. Unfortunately, um. This is the point where my carefully considered voiceover and uh, atmospheric music goes horribly wrong. Um, I turned up on the day and realised that they've actually taken away the old walkway in preparation for putting in a new one because the old one was uh, apparently dangerous. Luckily, 2021 me has us covered. I'd like to say I foretold the whole thing and that it was kind of second sight and it or just being sensible or something like that. But what actually happened was I turned up two years ago, realized I didn't know enough about the Wigton Martyrs to make a video about them, took some footage anyway, just because it was a nice day, and then staggered off home. Ill advisedly, I decided to subsidize my two years ago self's footage with my drone which resulted in a bit of a, we'll call it a drone sedent, where I sort of misjudged the position of some branches on a tree. Still, I'll just add that to my list of things I've broken and need fixed today. There are actually five Wigtown martyrs. The most famous would be two women, Margaret McLaughlin, who was 63, and Margaret Wilson, who was 18. There are also three men, William Johnson, John Mulroy, and George Walker. Mulroy is kind of an unusual Wigtonshire name, but more on that later. The three men were hunted down by the hated Major Windrum and hung without trial. Although not much is actually known about them beyond that. The women are probably better remembered by history because of 
Margaret Wilson's age, but also because of what happened to them. Margaret Wilson himself. And listen to this. This is interesting just because of the way they treated men and women differently, even in execution. Grew up on a farm near Newton Stewart called Glen Vernick. Weirdly, when I was 18, I actually helped out on that farm a few times. Her parents were Episcopalians. They'd taken the pledge they had to. They attended the services they were supposed to for fear of being reported for withdrawing. But her brothers were Covenanters. By February 1685, Scotland and England had a new king, James II of England and James VII of Scotland. There had been kind of hopes for things getting better with James actually being Catholic. He was actually the last Catholic monarch of the UK. But that didn't quite pan out. Thomas Wilson had disappeared into the hills to join a group hiding out there. His sisters, Margaret and Agnes, came here to Wigtown to visit some friends, including Margaret McLaughlin, a widow supposedly in secret. The sisters wound up being imprisoned. One version is that they refused to drink to the king's health. And then they were put into the thieves' hole, where Margaret McLaughlin joined them shortly afterwards. This is the martyr's cell. When I was a kid and I stayed here, I'd pass it going up and down the stairs in wonder. Local tradition has it that it was the cell. It's not the actual cell. This one actually dates back to the 19th century when the present building was constructed. Still, when you're five years old and heading off to bed, it's a wee bit spooky. To be honest, when you're 45 years old and heading off to bed, it would probably be just as spooky. The media is your enemy. People were deluded. Black Lives Matter released their 990 IRS filing. They collected 80. Let's again stop this. Uh... The women were indicted for having been present at the Battle of Bothwell Bridge, which seems kind of unlikely. And for having been at 40 Covenanter services, which were known as Covenanticals, that's a good word, they were required to take an oath of abjuration, swearing allegiance to the king. Refusal to take the oath essentially meant you could be executed without trial. Men were hung and shot, but women were drowned. All three refused to take the oath and were found guilty on all charges and sentenced to be tied to the palisades fixed in the sand within the flood mark of the sea and there to stand till the flood o'erflowed them. Margaret Wilson's father, Gilbert, went to Edinburgh to plead with the Privy Council of Scotland. He managed to get his younger daughter, Agnes, set free for a bond of £100 Scots. Reprieves were written out for the two Margarets and dated for the 30th of April. But the duty of execution fell to Robert Grierson of Lag, who was known locally as the Cruel Lag. Grierson was given the King's commission of suppressing the rebels, and he took it seriously. Eleven days after the reprieve was signed, the Cruel Lag carried out his sentence. I know what you're thinking. Where's the... I could have been standing in the tidal estuary of the River Bladnach on the banks of the Solway Firth. The river was diverted in the 19th century to build a new harbour. The women were tied to the stakes in the silt and then they waited for the incoming tide. Margaret McLaughlin was placed further in, meaning that inevitably she drowned first, forcing the younger Margaret to hear her choking. It was a cruel tactic but one that was clearly designed to make her repent or give in. As the tide came in and she started to struggle, she was offered a chance to pray for the king. And she said that she wished for the salvation of all men. But the damnation of none. Witnesses said she sang songs and quoted scripture. 
over the years, there has been some controversy about whether this actually happened. It was 20 years before the events were written down in the Kirk session records of both Henningham and Kirkenner parishes. They were backed up by elders and, and ministers who were present on the day, and the records were confirmed by the local church. It was still within living memory, and Margaret McLaughlin's daughter was one of the witnesses. The controversy hangs on the fact that there was a pardon. And don't forget, this was around the time of the Jacobite Rebellion, when the Stuart kings were trying to get back on the throne. Not everyone wanted them to be the villains of the piece. Some of the records are pretty harrowing. The Kirkinner Parish records say that Margaret McLaughlin's head was held down within the water by one of the town officers using his halberd at her throat till she died. Local legend has it that he told her to take another drink and that for the rest of his life he had an unquenchable thirst and had to drink from every stream and ditch he passed. Seems fair. A constable named Bell was said to have carried out his duties with a complete lack of feeling. When he was asked about the scene, he supposedly said, Oh, they just clept around the stobs like partons and prayed. Clept means web-footed. Partons are crabs. Stobs are, are the stakes. Bell's wife bore three children, all with clep fingers, and the family was referred to as the Kleppy Bells which was believed to be the sins of the father being revisited on the children. As for the cruel lag, he was said to have been in hell before he died, with the saliva burning holes where it fell, and his feet boiling puddles when he stepped in them. The stories inspired books, monuments, artwork for hundreds of years. This is Wigtown's Martyr's Monument, at the top of the appropriately named Windy Hill. This is a painting of Margaret Wilson by the artist Mealy, and this is a monument to her in Mar Place Cemetery in Stirling. So why is it so personal to me? Well, aside from having to walk past that cell all the time when I was a kid, and living here, and working on the farm Margaret Wilson grew up on, the name Mulroy is quite an unusual one. It's one I've taken a lot of flack for over the years. My granddad was called John Mulroy Glenn Parker. He passed on those middle names, and so did my dad, and so did I. Yeah, I know, that's probably some kind of child cruelty, especially as I've spent half my own life telling people it's not pronounced Milroy, that I'm not a pimp, or Millhouse from The Simpsons. But you know, tradition. The name's only actually been recorded from sometime around the 17th century. So the guy in that grave behind me, John Mulroy, is either an uncle or a cousin a few generations removed. Fair play to him. I'd be taking the oath. With my fingers crossed behind my back. See you next time, when I'll be telling you about a guy called William Wallace. So, that's... Um, from Scotland, unplugged, and uh, and that's uh, the story of the two murders. Again, it's really, I think it's important for people to understand that that history to be weary of it and if you're a christian to understand what the faith that this this had in, and to ask yourself is um governments around the world become less and less friendly to Christians, um, governments that were once considered Christian, governments of Christian countries, um, would you have that type of faith? And why is it important as a, a genealogist in understanding your family? Because chances are if you're um, 
your Scottish family is Protestant, they they went through that period with the the challenge, with the the fear of their life, and this would influence them for generations, and um, including the generations that arrived on the shores of North America 100 to 150 years later. Scottish history is interesting. All, all history is interesting. I'm, I'm a person who loves history. Um, but to take and look at it through the, the lens of today and put value, uh, today's values on, on it would be wrong. To take it and take it for what it's what it's saying, uh, what happened to the these these men and women, these 18,000 people that were killed, tortured, basically, especially in the case of these women, um, for having faith, for not saying that the king is king of the church, has the rights and rules to rule over the church. Something that is fundamental to all, well, most all Protestant religions, um, really except Anglicanism. Most uh, Protestant churches would, one of their uh, reasons for being was to um, not have that, um, the king or the monarch or an emperor be more than um, over uh, more than the state. It's a really important understanding of the separation of church and state uh, a lot of times that they're, but they also didn't want, they, there was a certain separation that was wanted in the sense that the rulers, uh, um, and it's, continued in the history in, in Scotland and Scottish churches, the church that I belong to now, the Free Church, was created of the Church of Scotland. Specifically, very similar thing. The, the landowners and um, still want to control over who could be appointed in the ministers and the congregations. And a group of um, Scottish ministers, Church of Scotland ministers in 1843, they, they separated and they brought a large portion of, of the ch national church with them. Um, they separated over the, the right of state interference. Um, that's the free part. It's nothing to do with, you don't talk, um, unfortunately. Um, but no, it, it has to do with that being free from state control. So what? Uh, just winding up here, uh, and I like to do as as usual. I usually go into a my what I call my last call. So let me ring my bell. I'm gonna try to pull that bell there, and we'll we'll see what happens. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I need to announce it's last, last call, call at, at the, the bar. bar. Oh. So, if you have any questions about this or anything in relation to Scottish history or genealogy, here's a good chance to, to ask it. Um, it's a, a free-for-all. Feel free to ask. And if you don't feel like asking live, you can always leave it in a comment, or you can email me um if you go to the about section on my my page you will see that there is an email address it is simply info at how we got here ca you email me at that and 
I can take a look and maybe we'll have a future live stream uh, talking about that. Uh, so thank you for watching. I really appreciate it. And until next time, farewell. Things change far away, far away, my dear friend. Things change far away, my friend. Farewells, they're not, they're not forever. They mean I'll miss you. Things change for a while, for a 